<clears throat> Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good. Fabulous. Glad to hear it. Okay. So I'm not an expert. He called me an expert. That's really sweet, but uh, I don't claim to be an expert in, in too much, which is better because I think as a learner, you don't want an expert teaching you anything because then you don't really know what they're talking about, right? So it's better to not have an expert. But uh, We are going to talk about somatoform disorders, and uh, yeah, feel free to interact because I think lectures can be really boring, so if you're interacting, I know you're all awake, and that's really good for your learning to stay awake in general. Yeah. Um, okay, so somatoform disorders. So every lecture should have objectives, I think. Um, I have personal goals as well, but my objectives are to give you a better understanding of the diagnostic criteria, a better understanding of the treatment approaches. Um, my personal goals, again, are to keep you awake and to hopefully entertain you. I find that when you're having fun, it activates your limbic system, you tend to remember more, so we'll try and make it fun. Maybe, I don't know, we'll see. All right. oh. So why in the world does internal medicine people need to know about somatoform disorders? Well, because you're going to see them. You've already, oh, sorry, I just hit a button. Uh, oh. Okay, back up. 10 to 15 percent you're going to see. You've probably already seen some somatoform disorders. Um, they're not easy to know right away. You don't see them and go, oh, that's totally a somatoform disorder. But they exist, so it's good to know about them. And you'll probably be tested on them too, so it's also a good reason to know about them. So they're the most prevalent mental disorder seen in the general medical setting, along with depression and anxiety. Um, and these guys don't generally want to see me. They want to see you, the internal medicine doc, right? And they want you to fix them, which can be very frustrating for you guys to fix them because it's not all that easy to do as you may already know. All right, gentle click. I think when I'm anxious, I like overclick. That's what's happening with the slides there, so. So what are the somatoform disorders? You can't just say they have a somatic, that you can't just diagnose them somatoform disorder because that's not really, that's a chapter heading. That's a lecture title. Um, so what are they? Well, they're right there. I could ask you, but you could just read them because they're right there. Somatization disorder is also called Brickay's syndrome which I only say that, you would never write that in a chart, right? But on tests, they'll sometimes put that as like a distractor. So if they put Brickay syndrome, they're probably just trying to distract you. If they really wanted you to get the answer and it were somatization disorder, they would put somatization disorder, quite honestly. Um, but they like to throw that in to distract people and then people choose it because they're like, oh, I don't know what that is, I'm gonna pick it. Yeah, don't ever do that on a test. Um, undifferentiated somatoform disorder, conversion, pain, hypochondriasis, BDD and somatoform NOS. Yeah, we love NOSs in psychiatry. They should have more of them in internal med, right? So not otherwise specified, when in doubt, NOS, yeah. Click, okay, so for you guys, our factitious disorder, that is Munchausen's, and malingering somatoform disorders. Are those somatoform disorders? No, thank you very much, yeah, so anyone who's gone to med school here has heard me lecture on somatoform disorders. Sorry, you have to hear it twice, but whatever. Yeah, so these are not somatoform disorders. Why? Exactly, because they're doing it on purpose. So if you do it on purpose, it's not a somatoform disorder. Somatoform disordered individuals are treated sometimes very poorly by the medical community because the medical community is very frustrated that they cannot help them, right? So when we feel incompetent or feel like we can't help the person, we get frustrated at them. That's a normal defense of ours. We don't like to not be able to help people when we're doctors, right? But these guys are a bit trickier to help. Now, fictitious and malingering, they're just doing it on purpose. Fictitious do it for primary gain and malingering do it for secondary gain. I know you guys have learned this, so I just wanted to review it real quick so that you're careful not to think that your person with pseudo seizures is doing it on purpose. Because if it's pseudo seizures, it's conversion disorder, it's not on purpose. Even though it may feel like it's on purpose and you're gonna get frustrated at them, they're not doing it on purpose. If you wanna get mad at somebody, get mad at these guys, because they're doing it on purpose. It's best not to get mad at all, but you gotta take your frustration out. The malingerers, that's a good way to go. So yeah, no, good answer. Thank you for participating even with food in your mouth. Good. Everybody else is quiet, so thanks, all right. And they're not even eating. Um, 
Okay, so I thought I'd review the criteria real quick just because, you know, it's weird. I always freeze when I do, we do grand rounds in here, but I guess all I have to do is come up and lecture and then I won't be cold. <laughs> Something about being on stage warms you right up. So if anybody gets cold and you want to come up and help me out, let me know. It'll warm you right up. Uh, somatization disorder. So it has very specific criteria. It's generally female patients. Um, symptoms start before age 30, and they have these things. Four pain, two GI, one GU, or sexual symptom, and a pseudoneurological. So what's pseudoneurological? What does that mean? Good, you're so participatory, I love it. Okay, yay. Uh, that's right. I don't, <laughs> nobody said anything, by the way, VA. Um, yes, that's right. So it's something you would refer them to a neurologist for. So paresthesias, paresis migraines, seizures, blindness, they lose a sense of some sort, deafness, so that conversion disorder stuff. Pseudoneurological, so it's neurological, but there's no underlying neurological cause. Just let to check, make sure you all knew that. Yeah, yeah, participant again. You're great, you want to just come to the front row? <laughs> Hang out with me up here? What? Does it happen before age 30 is this question. Oh. Does it have to? According to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, our psychiatry Bible, symptoms have to start before age 30, per the diagnostic criteria. So why they put that in there, I have no idea, right? But generally, they, they will have. But yes, per criteria, they do, oddly enough. But you always have this as an out. So undifferentiated somatoform disorder is not to be confused with somatoform disorder and not otherwise specified, even though I think they kind of sound alike. But undifferentiated somatoform disorder is when you can't get all the criteria. So maybe it started after age 30. Or they have two pain, one GI, and a pseudoneurological. But you can't get that sexual symptom like dyspareunia or whatever. So if they don't meet all the criteria, you're doing the review of systems, you're like, come on, have one more pain, and you can't find it, then it's undifferentiated somatoform disorder. And they can't overlap, so if they have abdominal pain and you want to count that as a pain and a GI, you can't, they have to be distinct and separate. Or if they have migraine, you can't call, call that a pain symptom and a pseudoneurological. Mm, yeah, you can't cheat like that. So when you can't get them all, it's undifferentiated. So conversion disorder, <coughs> pardon me, is uh, the sudden loss, so it happens real quick, sudden loss of voluntary motor or sensory function. So instant blindness, this is hysterical blindness you may have heard, or deafness. These guys have the best prognosis except the pseudo-seizure people. So these represent something to the patient, um, psychologically speaking. So all of these somatoform disorders have intrapsychic pain. So this unresolved, unconscious stuff that they're not in touch with. And it's hard to get them in touch with, by the way. But um, So it can manifest physically. So, you know, the classic story is the priest, rabbi, minister, religious guy, or gal, um, walking along and goes by a little playground and sees a kid, has a sexual thought, boom, goes blind. So that represents this completely bad feeling, uh, ego dystonic feeling, and so the person made themselves blind, not on purpose. Again, they're not doing this on purpose. And they're really blind, right? Like, there's nothing wrong with their optic nerve, their pupils react to light, but they can't see. I mean, you throw something at them, boom, you're going to hit them. They're blind because they're unconsciously making themselves blind. But as quickly as it can come on, it can go away, which is kind of cool. Pseudo seizures represent the whole body, right? So if I'm having a seizure, it's involving a lot of systems. And that's really representing just they feel completely out of control, just thrashing around. And you can distinguish pseudo seizures from general seizures, one by an EEG, obviously. But also, they tend to be careful when they fall, they don't bite their tongue, and they don't tend to urinate on themselves. So again, the medical professional sees this and thinks they're doing it on purpose. Again, they're not doing this on purpose, okay? They don't even call them pseudo-seizures too much anymore. The term now is psychogenic non-epileptiform seizure, or PNES, if you really want to sound smart. But you'll still hear pseudo-seizures. And patients will tell me they have pseudo-seizures. Um, they've been told that. 
The thing about pseudo seizures is you can have a true underlying seizure disorder. So you have generalized tonic clonic seizures, but you also have pseudo seizures in addition. So just because they have pseudo seizures, or PNES, doesn't mean they don't also have a, an actual seizure disorder, which can be confusing to the medical provider, which is why I thought you should know. Okay. So, do y'all know LaBelle in difference? <laughs> My French is really good. Uh, yeah, so LaBelle uh, means what? LaBelle in difference. Beautiful. Who, what, what? Hmm? Beauty. Beauty. Well, yes, Belle is beautiful. So in this case, for conversion, though, not so beautiful. Uh, it basically means they don't care. Yeah, so they have complete indifference. So the patient I saw at Norton's once on consult, I went into the room, and they were paralyzed. And they, she said, yeah, I woke up this morning, and I couldn't move my legs. OK, I don't know about y'all, but if I woke up and I could not move my legs, I'd be like, ah, right? Like, I'd totally be freaking out. But they were just pretty chill about it, really. Just, yep, can't move my legs. So that was total LaBelle. It's interesting. And whether or not she was beautiful, I don't remember. But she didn't care, is the point. So that's a classic thing on tests. Now, not all labelle indifference is conversion disorder. Uh, there are some parietal lesions that can cause labelle indifference as well. But or indifference, or I don't know how to say it with the French accent. I'll just say it with my Kentucky accent. OK, so that's conversion disorder. It happens as quickly. It goes away as quickly as it happens sometimes. And we'll get to treatment on these. I know I'm skipping treatment, but that's because it's tricky. So pain disorder. How many of you have actually written that somebody has pain disorder in a chart? How many of you diagnose pain disorder? None, right? Or at least I see none, unless you all are just ignoring me. But OK, um, no hands at the VA either. <laughs> OK, so pain disorder is really hard to diagnose. Um, but you've probably seen pain disorder. So pain disorder is tricky. Because it says the pain has to be out of proportion to what would normally be expected. OK, well, what? OK, so we don't have painometers. I looked it up on Google Images. The only thing I found was an itchy and scratchy cartoon. So there is no painometer. I wish there were, right? Yeah. Um, so I got one laugh. That's something better. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, so we can't measure pain. We can measure vital signs and see if they're throwing up and writhing around and things like that or sweating. Uh, but there's no clear way. And we all experience pain subjectively differently, right? Particularly if you're having a good day or a bad day, your mood totally affects your pain perception, right? So what I say to the students is you may be out at the club having a good time with your friends. The next day you wake up, you have a bruise. You have no idea where it came from, right? Because you didn't feel the pain. Now, some of that's substance-induced anesthesia. But when it's not even, you wake up, you got a bruise, you don't know where it came from. It's because you're in a good mood. Whereas if you guys have ever had a really bad day or post-call day and you hit your knee, right, and you got lots of patients to see and then you get a paper cut, man, that hurt, like that paper cut or that hitting your knee on the desk hurts so much more when you haven't slept and you have 10 more patients to see and you're attending gel in that year or whatever, right? So our mood affects our pain perception. Now telling pain disorder people that their pain is all in their head is actually accurate but really not helpful for your therapeutic rapport with the patient. Right? So your patient's not going to appreciate that you say it's all in their head, but we know the spinothalamic tract ends where? In the head, right? Yeah. Like, so all our pain is in our head, of course, because that's where our brain lives. So it is true that it's all in our head, but so is really a stroke or a brain tumor, but you don't say it's all in your head. So don't tell them it's all in their head, please. Please. So remember, these guys aren't doing this on purpose, and they may have lots of other comorbid stuff going on. So say they have cancer, which is the majority of patients I see as a psycho-oncologist. But just coping with cancer is really stressful. And then the pain they're experiencing from either the radiation burns or whatever might be out of proportion to what would normally be expected. Again, the normal is really hard to define. So pain disorder can exist with a lot of comorbid conditions. OK. Um, Oh, I've got all of that on there. Okay, good. I haven't looked at these slides in a while, but it just flows. Okay. Hypochondriasis is a defense mechanism, but it's also a somatoform disorder. So, as, bless you, as I've told medical students, I'll tell you all too. So, second year of med school is really stressful for those of you who forgot, right? And so when kids, not kids, when young adults are learning, um, sorry, 
Young adults are learning pathology. They start to experience a lot of the symptoms they're learning about. So Dr. Pursued gets really busy in student health and people are like palpating themselves and listening to their hearts and freaking out and feeling their abdomens. And so that's a defense mechanism. And then they go see Dr. Pursued and he says, you're okay. And then their anxiety goes away and they're good. That's a defense mechanism. That's different than the somatoform disorder of hypochondriasis, which is a persistent thing that they are preoccupied that something's wrong. And it doesn't have to stay the same thing. It could be, I'm convinced I have HIV today, but maybe in a week or two, I'm convinced I have colon cancer or something like that. So it doesn't always have to be the same thing. Um, but they know there's something really, really wrong. And you, doctor, are not finding it. And so they're going to get really frustrated with you. And what that's probably going to do is make you really frustrated at them. Right? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe not you guys, but some doctors get really frustrated at their patients. Hypochondriasis patients are really hard to treat. So just take a deep breath and say to yourself, they're not doing this on purpose. They have some intrapsychic conflict. They're not doing this to me personally. And then go back in the room and try and be as patient and calm and kind as you can. And try to avoid lots of tests. So these guys end up with a scope in every orifice at some point, right? Because they're convinced something's wrong and they convince you to check them out and so they end up getting scoped everywhere. They have multiple charts, they're on volume 23, right? So try to avoid that as best you can. Do the normal routine test, gentle reassurance, regular visits, that's the way to really approach hypochondriasis. Again, it's, it's as frustrating for you as it is for them, maybe, or the other way, I don't know. It's really frustrating for both. But on tests, they always ask what's the best treatment. Really the best treatment is regularly scheduled visits with a very patient primary care doctor. Hopefully that will be one of you in here. <laughs> so if it's not you and you're feeling not so patient, maybe refer them to a more patient colleague. Try not to do too many tests. Hypochondriasis is unique because it's not predominantly female. Most of the somatoform disorders are predominantly female. Okay, BDD. Has anybody have BDD patients? VA, anybody BDD? Okay, they put their head down, started texting again. That's okay. Um, you don't have to look at the screen. Uh, so body dysmorphic disorder often goes unrecognized. Uh, these guys don't come in saying, I have body dysmorphic disorder, help me. They live at home, they live in sadness and stressed out about it, but they don't really talk about it much. Some go to plastic surgeons to try and fix themselves, but the plastic surgeon is really wasting his or her time because the patient's never really going to be happy. Unfortunately, the most salient case would be who in the media? Anybody? Michael Jackson. Yeah. Tragic case, right? So regardless of how many nose operations, he's never going to be happy with his nose. Really, psychotherapy would have been better for him. Hopefully he had some. I don't know. Tragic tale. Also best to not treat these people with too many benzos and other drugs. BDD may have equal sex prevalence. Again, it's pretty unrecognized because undiagnosed. Um, but they stay focused on one defect throughout. So it's always just their nose or just the mole on their face or their ear. It's often something up here on their head um, that they feel is crooked. Okay, so they all have intrapsychic pain. Now you know what intrapsychic pain is. They all can benefit from psychotherapy. Now the studies, when they do studies, and this review of like a bunch of studies, say CBT, go with CBT. What's CBT? Yeah, good, participation, love it. Um, yes, cognitive behavioral therapy is kind of the classic standard. It can work for pretty much anything, at least according to the people who do it. Um, it it's got its role in, in this disorder group. Um, but the thing about cognitive behavioral therapy is the reason it's so widely studied in studies is because it's really easy to replicate and easy to regimen. So you just follow, you do this first, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this. So it's easy to do in a study. Whereas supportive psychotherapy or insight-oriented psychotherapy is really much more different per provider and harder to put into a research study. So. That's why you'll see more CBT and interpersonal therapy studies, IPT and CBT, in case you ever wondered. Okay, so the best treatment for all of these is psychotherapy. 
Now, can you get all these patients to go to therapy? No. They don't want to see us. They want to see you, and they want you to fix them, right? But how you talk to your patient can make all the difference. So saying the therapeutic modalities we have available at this current time are kind of letting you down. I'm sorry that we can't, you know, get your pain better or help with this. So that must be really frustrating for you. Maybe it would be helpful for you to talk to a psychiatrist about some of that frustration. And, why, you know, why don't we refer you to one and you can just see. So it's not, okay, I've done all I can do for you and you are not getting better, so you need to go see a shrink, right? Like it's how you present it that really makes the difference. Because these patients are sometimes a little fragile. And so they're going to be more easily maybe ticked off by you and frustrated at you, which will make you frustrated at them. So try and get them to go see a psychiatrist if you can't. Or it doesn't have to be a psychiatrist, really. Psychologist, social worker who does therapy, marriage and family therapist, whatever. Just get them into some therapy if you can. Um, yeah, so I just said that. How you recommend the therapy can make a huge difference. And so what are you going to do in the meantime while you're waiting for them to get in to see a therapist? Well. You're probably going to treat them with some medications. So what medications have you guys used for somatoform disorders? Since you're all so talkative today. Huh, what? Paxil, what? I'll be back. Something for anxiety? Okay. Okay. So a lot of these, she said something for anxiety. Because um, they can't hear the audience, right? Yeah, I'm thinking about you all here. All right. Um, yeah, so a lot of these patients have depression and anxiety. They're depressed because you're, you're not helping them. And then they're anxious about some things too, particularly body dysmorphic disorder. So yes, treating them with an anxiolytic. Um, hopefully not Xanax. Let me just do my I hate Xanax. Xanax is the devil speech real quick since I've got all these primary care docs here. Xanax is the devil. Okay, like if we could make Alprazolam disappear forever from this planet, that would be a wonderful thing. So when you're reaching for an anxiolytic, if you can please reach for the Xanax last, like let's just try and make it go away. Just say no to Xanax. Okay, I'm done. Um, okay. <laughs> anxiolytics can be helpful. Which anxiolytics do you like to use? Which one? You like Xanax? What? No, what? Well, I think older physicians, older primary care physicians, in fact, really like Xanax. So when you rotate with them, you see them use it. But I think our newer generation, is that true that you all know that Xanax is not a good thing? Hopefully you've learned that, please. Okay. So, yeah, we just got to wait for some of the older docs to retire. With new health care reform, they may. So um, we might be okay there. Yeah, so what are some other anxiolytics? Let's talk meds. Let's talk what can you all prescribe these people? Buspar, buspirone. Okay, so a non-addictive anxiolytic. Good. It's generally better for generalized anxiety. It works for a really small group of people, and if you can find those people, man, they love it. They're like, oh my God, everybody should be on buspar. Why didn't I have this sooner? Why didn't everybody ever give this to me? For the other huge amount of people, they think it's a sugar pill. If I could figure out who was in that small group, I would give it to them every time. So do try it, but it doesn't work for everybody, unfortunately. You had your hand up. I think. Uh, an, SSRI, an SSRI. Okay. So yeah, you got your paroxetine, your sertraline, your fluoxetine, your escitalopram, your citalopram. Good. Yes. I'm trying not to say brand names because, you know, it's not supposed to be good when you give lectures. But yes, those are wonderful. Try those. Now, if there's an undiagnosed bipolar disorder, you may induce mania. I think I have an SSRI slide. Let's see. We'll just... There. Oh, SSRIs, good. So think about side effects. What are side effects of SSRIs? Sexual side effects, yes. Which one's the worst? Which SSRI is the worst for sexual side effects? Paroxetine, Paxil. So particularly, well, any young person, but young males, I always avoid Paxil. But yes, it's a, those are all good. Um, sexual side effects, what else? Nausea. Zoloft's probably, sertraline's probably the worst for nausea. Somnolence. Somnolence. Yeah. 
rash, nausea, vomit, diarrhea, high, I don't know, constipate, yeah, all the regular stuff. But if they do have an undiagnosed bipolar, you may induce mania, which could be bad. They inhibit platelet binding, so if they are thrombocytopenic, you may want to take that into consideration, because then if they only have like two platelets left and those guys don't want to stick together, that could be really bad. So I always struggle with my thrombocytopenic patients on which antidepressant to use, because they mess with the platelet binding. They're all category C, and just because I do cancer care, they mess with tamoxifen. So if they're on tamoxifen, don't use SSRIs. There's also SNRIs. You all use SNRIs? Serotonin, norepinephrine, reuptake inhibitors? Yeah? Because what's Cymbalta's commercial? Depression hurts, right? Okay, so they have the pain indication now, right? Duloxetine, Cymbalta got the pain indication. Yeah, so we see a lot of that. Is anybody seeing Melnasoprin used? Uh, Savella? Because they didn't market to psychiatrists at all. But the pain clinic's using it, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, but it's an SNRI. But no psychiatrists use it, so I know really nothing about it. Um, Venlafaxine's generic, so if is the only generic, yeah. Yeah. Well, these guys have the indication, so I'm going to say, yeah, just from studies, the SNRI sh have been shown to help with pain. But have you seen one more percent of my question? Yes. So SNRIs do tend to work better for pain. But as I stated earlier, when your mood is better, your pain doesn't hurt as much. So in general, just getting their mood up, whether it's an SSRI, an SNRI, or an atypical antidepressant, getting their mood better helps with their pain. They can't, so the norepinephrine component, when you increase that amount of norepinephrine, yeah, you can, their blood pressure can go up and they can feel a little over jazzed, over, yeah. So you gotta kind of titrate them slowly. Um, but it's probably that norepinephrine component that's helping with the pain, so you wanna get them to a good amount, but yeah, watch the blood pressure and watch them for activation. What about the GABA Love GABA ergic agents. Um, but we'll talk about TCAs and then jump to the GABA land. Yeah, no, GABA is great. So um, TCAs, tricyclic antidepressants. So the old school docs, what do they use? Elevil, 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 right? Amitriptyline, you guys seen it used? Yeah, totally, right? So amitriptyline is probably used the most. It's got a pain indication, as does a mipramine, another tricyclic. Um, but yeah, people still love amitriptyline. But you might want to get an EKG. I mean, TCAs are kind of rough on the heart, AV block, arrhythmias, QT prolongation, a lot of orthostasis, things like that. So it's used a lot by the older generation, and it, they are decent meds and affordable, but just keep an eye on their heart. And you guys have better access to EKGs than we do, so it could work out great for you. Um, GABA, oh, where'd my GABA slide go? It's probably in here somewhere. Well, so you brought up Neurontin, Gabapentin. I, I think Gabapentin is a wonderful medicine. I'm so glad it finally went generic, and it's on our gold card here at the ACB. Just fabulous. Makes it seven bucks a month for our patients with no insurance. Do y'all use Gabapentin? Do you use Gabapentin? Yeah. By the way, I own no stock in any drug companies. I am in no way paid to talk about medicines, but Gabapentin's fabulous. It's great for anxiety. It's great for pain. It slows pain transmission, right? It's, GABA, it's inhibitory, it slows down nerve travel, right? So I tell patients it's like a soothing bath for your nerves, right? Who wouldn't like that? It can make them gain weight and make them feel a little goofy, and they're thinking about making it a Schedule four narcotic, which would really put a damper on the whole gold card thing, because no scheduled drugs are on the gold card. Um, so some people are abusing it, they're taking it in high doses to feel drugged. Um, but I think it's a wonderful thing for anxiety. So I use it a lot, and pain. Um, other GABAergic agents I haven't seen as much success with, like Gabatril, Tiagabine. Um, but that can, even though it's anti-seizure, it can cause seizures, which is kind of weird. And I don't know what the other GABAergic agent I used to use, but it didn't really work well. But big thumbs up for Gabapentin. Good. Um, Somatoform disorders. Again, they're not doing it on purpose. Make sure there's not something else going on, right? Like, just because they come in with 
borderline personality disorder, don't immediately think they have a somatoform disorder because you know, things like MS present really weird and we don't want to just jump to the conclusion they have some other psych diagnosis because they already have one. Um, that happens sometimes. I don't think you all would do that, but it's happened. And then know that just because they now have a somatoform disorder, they won't eventually have something else. So sometimes these patients are so annoying to their primary care provider that the primary care provider stops scheduling appointments with them and then the patient doesn't get their regular checkups, right? So I jumped away from other meds that we treat them with. Um, but I think that the, stop reading the case. Y'all are reading the case. Stop it. <laughs> I think in general, SSRIs, SNRIs, and GABAergic agents are the way to go. If you can get them into psychotherapy or CBT of some sort, great. Um, TCAs, if you have to use them, are still an option. Do you all use other medicines that you're sitting there thinking about? The one thing I'd say about conversion disorder, if you give them a benzo, you're probably going to make them worse because conversion disorder, if you think about it, is they're trying to disconnect from reality as it is. So when you which I'm not doing the anxiety disorder lecture, but much like PTSD where they can dissociate or disconnect, if you give them a medicine that helps them disconnect or dissociate, you're only going to keep them sicker longer. Um, but they love it. So people with PTSD um, or dissociative disorders or conversion disorders, they love the benzodiazepines because it helps them click off, to turn that light switch off, to disconnect from reality. But when you give them that benzo, you're, making, you're just keeping them sick, not getting them better. But they'll love you and they'll keep coming back. All right, other med, look, any other med stuff, farm stuff, questions? Like how to dose them or anything like that? Or? Good, thank you. Good, thank you. What do you do? Oh, let me repeat the question for the VA because I didn't forget about you. Um, so what do you do when you've maxed your SSRI out and you've had them on it for a couple months and they're still having symptoms? So what do you do, doctor? Honestly, I'll probably refer to psych. Good. You would refer them to the, the hopefully, expert. Yeah, the specialist, that is. Or try another one. What do you guys do? You've maxed your SSRI out. Yeah, what do you do? You're going to add gabapentin. So you're assuming that they're... Symptoms are just anxiety, not depression, or because that would help their anxiety. Yeah. Two different agents is a good way to go. Referring to us is always a good way to go too. Um, but if they've only been on one SSRI and they're failing it, I would try another SSRI first. We do a lot of polypharmacy these days. It, I, I think it's probably bad in general that we do so much polypharm. So if we can avoid it and we can stick with mono agents, I don't know the right word, just one medication, that would be better in general for the patient, for their pocketbook. Um, so I would have titrated them, done a cross titration, like decrease this one while increasing another one, give that a try. If they fail two SSRIs, I'm gonna jump classes i going to jump into the SNRIs um, or try an atypical. My actual favorite, again, we're not doing the antidepressant, anti-anxiety lecture, but my absolute favorite medicine in the world is mirtazapine, um, particularly because I see a lot of chemo patients, but it helps you sleep. It's antidepressant, anti-anxiety. It's got 5-HT3, so it's anti-nausea. So it's got like all these wonderful things about it. So I can treat insomnia, depression, anxiety, and nausea and anorexia, because some people are just not hungry, they have no appetite. With one pill for seven bucks on the gold card, which is pretty sweet. So my favorite medicine in the world is mirtazapine. It has weight gain associated with it and orthostasis, but other than that, love it. If they're just having sexual side effects on an SSRI, but they're responding to their SSRI, what might you add if they don't have a history of seizure disorder? 
Xanax? No. <laughs> you fail. Get out. No, I'm just kidding. Um, bupropion. So, Wellbutrin, bupropion, is good for taking away sexual side effects. So, if they like their SSRI but they're having sexual side effects, you can just add some bupropion and maybe help them quit smoking in addition. But only if they have no seizure history. Okay, that's just like a big pharmacology. We could just talk about meds all day. That's cool. Um, other med questions? Since you have a psychiatrist in the room? Yeah. If they really like their SSRI and they're like, my depression's gone, my anxiety's gone, but I have no sexual functioning or whatever their sexual decreased libido or whatever, then I would add the bupropion because depression and anxiety are pretty debilitating. But we want them to have good sexual functioning. So I would add the bupropion then. I try to do the lowest amount, so I would probably, to keep it on the gold card, because I see a lot of patients without insurance, do the SR 100 milligrams QAM. So it, even though SR is usually BID, I would just give it to them QAM, see how that works. Because it wakes you up. Well, butrin's a, anybody know the mechanism of action of bupropion? Yeah, dopamine and norepinephrine. So it's an NDRI. It's the only norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitor. Very good. Yay, Mike Williams would be very proud if you went to school here. Um, okay, so the other option is people are using atypical antipsychotics now. So Abilify or Piprazole now has an add-on adjunctive for when your antidepressant isn't working. But again, this is this whole polypharmacy craze that we're in. Seroquel has an add-on adjunctive when your antidepressant isn't working. Seroquel has a lot of side effects. We psychiatrists use Seroquel too much. I don't know if y'all know that, but we do. Because we hate Ambien and Lunesta and what's the other one, Sonata. We don't like those. The things that start with Z's, Opidum, Zell, Lepilon, whatever, I don't know. <laughs> I can't think of the generics, but uh, we don't use them because we see a lot of substance relapse with those. So we like the Quetiapin and Seroquel. But I actually think melatonin's better while I'm here. Just try melatonin. If your patients have trouble sleeping, melatonin, man, it's cheap. It's something your pineal gland makes anyway, has very few drug-drug interactions. They're not going to relapse on drugs or alcohol. Melatonin first. All right, it's not a sleep lecture either. Sorry, Alan. Um, other med questions? You have a psychiatrist handy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, pregabalin. There you go, the Lyrica. Yeah. Price. Um, so he asked Lyrica versus Neurontin efficacy. Uh, they probably work about the same, but total price difference. He's asking if there's a really big difference in the Lyrica dosing from 75 BID, 150 BID. I don't ever use Lyrica. I think. Gabapentin works wonderfully, and so many of my patients don't have insurance, they can't afford it. So I have no idea, because I, I think a pain doc might know better. But I try not to use Lyrica if I can use a cheaper alternative. I, I try to always stick, start with the $4 meds, then move to the gold card $7 meds, and then go for the pricey stuff. Even if they have commercial insurance, because there's tier one, tier two, tier three, y'all know if you bought antibiotics or anything, your different tiers, your copays. I don't know. Great question, no idea. If Lyrica ever goes generic, I'll come back and lecture and let you know. Um, med questions? Okay, how are we doing? All right, so I just threw some cases in here, I don't know why. Um, why not, I guess, would be my answer. So a 19-year-old, and she's female, is evaluated at University Health Clinic for sudden onset blindness. School's been in session for two weeks, and she admits this is the first time she's been away from home, and she misses her family. During class, before taking a quiz, she began to have vision problems, consisting of a loss of color vision for approximately five minutes, in which everything was in black and white, followed by complete vision loss. She's been having mild headaches for the past six weeks, loc located in the frontal area, and not associated with prodromes or other neurological symptoms. Her medical history is otherwise non-contributory, and her family history includes a grandmother with MS. On the physical exam, vitals are normal, pupils are equally round and reactive, optic discs are totally fine. 
Everything else is good, normal, within normal limits, W and L, right? Um, so what do you think is the most likely diagnosis? Good, thank you. Okay, I was just going to stand here really and take a little nap until somebody said something. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, conversion disorder. Yeah, sudden onset. Eyes look good. They've checked her out, though. Trying to make sure there's not any kind of other stuff going on. But since the title of my lecture is somatoform disorders, the most likely answer to my question is a somatoform disorder. Yeah, so good. Way to pay attention. Okay, a 43-year-old woman is evaluated during an initial, initial visit. She's brought with her a written list of health problems. And you love these patients when you're in a hurry, by the way. Okay, so she's got headaches, muscle pain, muscle weakness, abdominal pain, diarrhea. She's got some sinusitis. She's frequently having UTIs. She's having some sexual intimacy problems. For the past four years, her health problems are interfering with her work. Previous treatments for her headache have included venlafaxine, verapamil, propranolol, gabapentin. For each of these, she's had no relief and or not been able to tolerate the medicine. She's been seen by a neurologist, gastroenterologist, rheumatologist, various other ologists, and nobody's found anything. Previous labs include all kinds of stuff, right? Because that's what we do with these patients. We run lots of labs. So CBC, sed ray, B12, folate, CMP, TSH, lipids, rheumatoid, ANA, blah, 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 all fine. MRI was done, colonoscopy was done, CT of the abdomen were all done. Lots of tests, huh? How much do you think those cost. Um, she's not had tick exposures or bites. No target-like rash. All right, so anyway, she gets a little uh, angry when you ask her if she's feeling depressed. So what's she got? I can just check Facebook while you're <laughs> I'm just kidding. Ah. Lyme disease, right? No. <laughs> She's a total malingerer, right? Yeah, no. Yeah. Somatization disorder. Yeah, and so these patients, again, are so frustrating because they do have a long list when they come into your office, and it's very frustrating for you. So that's kind of my point of today's lecture. I think my last, oh, what do you want to do for management? What do you want to manage her with? You want to? Get her a lumbar puncture because she hasn't had one of those yet. Yeah. So, to ask you a quick question. How would you differentiate that scenario from hypochondriasis? Yeah, so hypochondriasis and somatization disorder, how can you differentiate them? And test makers love to put those two as answer choices because they are very similar. So, my answer would be what is the, well, my answer is a question, sorry. So, what is the diagnostic criteria of somatization disorder? So four pain, two GI, one GU, one, su one pseudoneurological. Yeah, if they don't have four pain, two GI, one GU, and one pseudoneurological, it's not somatization disorder. It could be undifferentiated somatoform disorder. But the hypochondriasis is very similar. They've had lots of tests, they have lots of charts, they have lots of complaints. But nowhere in that did it say, at least I don't think, that she is convinced there's a serious underlying medical disease that you're not, like, they're convinced they have HIV or colon cancer. Or, or, yeah, like, yeah, there's something really wrong with me and you can't find it. Not, I have headaches, my back hurts, I have this, 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 this. Yeah. So, does that help? Yeah, yeah good. All right, I like to help. All right, so what do you all want to do? Get her an MRI, some CBT, look for some borrelia. I don't even know how to say that anymore. Bergdorferi. Gosh, I forgot about that word. LP, huh? Fentanyl patch. He's gonna give her a fentanyl patch. Everybody down with that? A little Xanax, a little fentanyl patch. It's good. It's good. Uh, are you are you an anesthesiology? Is this your like prelim? Year? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Xanax and fentanyl patch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So CBT would probably help her if you could get her there, but. Um, Switching from nortriptyline to venlafaxine is not going to do a bit of good. She's already been on venlafaxine. Okay, the last case I think was an anxiety one when I used to do anxiety and somatoform together, but they took it away from me and gave it to Dr. Mackey. So hopefully Dr. Mackey's anxiety lecture was fabulous. So 
I've blah blahed enough. Um, hopefully you have a clearer picture of the somatoform disorders. Hopefully you know somatoform disorder in and of itself is not a diagnosis, that they, it's a chapter heading, okay. And now you're a little more familiar. So when you see a pain disorder, it's still gonna be frustrating, but at least you can diagnose them. And maybe you have some different treatment options you can think about. You're always welcome to like, I don't know, email me if you have a question. I may or may not be able to answer it, but I don't mind to do like email help. Just, you know, send secure if you put the patient's name, but don't put the patient's name and you don't have to send it secure. Um, but you're welcome to consult with me. If you have any cancer patients, I'm always taking new patients, so feel free to refer some cancer patients my way. I like treating those guys. Um, other thoughts, concerns, questions, compliments? Yeah. Psychiatrists in general, I don't necessarily like the Seroquel for insomnia, but I'm just saying if you have a psych patient, you're going to probably see them on Seroquel because our guys tend to overuse it sometimes. But it is sedating, it's histaminergic, it's a low dopamine block, it's not a strong dopamine blocker, so it's a pretty benign medicine, uh, just like Thorazine was, Clopromazine, which is why we give that to kids when we need them to take a nap um, when they're all agitated. But not a lot of dopamine blockades, so less extrapyramidal symptoms, but pretty sedating. Patients were abusing that for a while too, though. They'd chop it up and snort it. People today, you know. What are you going to do? But now that we have the XR, they don't tend to do that as much. It's like P90X. I don't know why I did that. XR. Seroquel, XR. <laughs> I'm a dork. Okay. Um, Y'all good? Question. Um, what's somatoform pain disorder? Somatoform uh, pain disorder, okay. Are you typically seeing, do they actually, do these patients actually ever have a positive response to more traditional pain medications, or are these, do they typically, do they fail in everything, they're still having pain, chronic complaining? So, do pain disorder patients respond to pain medications? I, I think they can, um, but they're still going to have that breakthrough pain, um, and then you're they're going to become opiate dependent, just inevitably, if they're on pain med. If we can avoid opiates, I think it's better for their cognitive processing and their future outcomes in general. Um, but I think they can resp respond to the pain med, but I think it's only going to be short-lived. Um, but things like relaxation and yoga and Pilates and biofeedback and mindfulness, all that stuff that people are like, whatever. Like, that's some good stuff. It really does work. Um, it's just a matter of getting the patient to do it, invested in it. Y'all should do it too, by the way, yoga or Pilates or something, or P90X. I mean, good stuff, seriously. You guys have stressful jobs being students and residents. It's not easy. Highly recommend the yoga exercise stuff. I just found it, so I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> it's good stuff. Questions from the VA? Because y'all were really participatory today. Anything? Got anything going on there? No? Good. The boss boss good? Cool. I haven't been there in forever. All right. Well, thank you for paying attention. Thank you for staying awake. And email me if you have questions.